got you tuned. Man, we almost made it all the way through. I don't know. Like, I give up. But at least three quarters of the way is uh, good enough. Must be Monday afternoon, Monday evening. Kevin Peterson live with Five Family Matters. How are you, sir? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. How are you today, sir? Good, good. You joined us from uh, Denver, Colorado. We can never keep track of you. You're all over the place, international. I, you know, I just don't sit still well. You know, I, 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 I don't know what it is. I just got to, I got to keep it moving. Got to keep one foot ahead of the law, you know. <laughs> Go stalk him over on Instagram, Kevin W. Peterson. He's got all kinds of incredible content. You can comment. You can get a free book. You know, if you want family coaching, go over to chronicope.us. It's also on the bottom. It's free resources. Every time you log on, you're not going to get charged. But Kevin and his whole staff do family coaching and Chronicope Facebook page, like the hottest Facebook page going right now. Well, free from all marketers and everything, just families helping families. Chronico Facebook page, check it out. And uh, you got a lot going on. Like you travel a lot and you got a lot going on in the Chronico. Yeah, you know, we got, we try. I mean, uh, just kind of, just trying to, just trying to spread the good word, spread the gospel of hope and faith. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, keep spreading it. The world needs it. Yeah, we like what we do. We have a lot of fun with what we do. You know, we enjoy engaging with people and, and trying to, to teach them how to hold boundaries, set boundaries, and tell people that, hey, it's okay, we're here to help. And, you know, that's the deal. That's the deal. You're quite good at it. Let's get right into the issues. I'm ready. I am concerned about my 25-year-old husband. We've been married for two years now. We met in treatment five years ago. There's no substance abuse basically going on. Just gaming 24-7, drinks coffee and Red Bull, does not sleep. She's gone on, like, is basically isolating, doesn't go out for date night. They have kids. Uh, he's got kids. It's a stepmom of the situation, but uh, doesn't, like she says in her email, doesn't go out and kick the soccer ball or play catch in the backyard. Just basically playing gaming 24-7. She wants to know... A, there's an, an issue, and B, how to help and step in. And she talks about boundaries, but she's confused as to there doesn't seem to be substance abuse. So, great question. Um, so remember, when we're setting boundaries, there's three categories we look at, three primary categories, drugs and alcohol, work and school, and then family behavior. So it sounds like in, we can set aside the first two because it sounds like he's sober <clears throat> and it sounds like he's working or going to school. But family behavior is obviously a primary issue because like you said, there's not a lot of family engagement and he's, he's got himself glued into, you know, uh, which could, could actually be an addiction situation. But why don't we start with family behavior because she feels like, you know, her needs are not being met, right? That you know, her needs as a partner are not being met and her needs as a mom, you know, needing a, a father for the children are not, being met. So how I would respond to that is, you know, sit him down and say, Hey, you know, I love you, but this isn't working for me, you know, and I need you to be less engaged with the gaming and the television and more engaged with me and the kids and start with having that initial conversation and see how he responds. And if the initial response is, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have a problem. <laughs> you know, we have a problem. So then we take it to the next level and we say, okay, you know, Hey, I feel like we need to talk to somebody because this isn't working for me. And we go from there and see what happens. And, you know, and, and maybe bring in a kid, say, I like, I'd like us to talk to a couples counselor, you know, and, and then, you know, we can definitely help you wherever you live. We can help you find someone to talk to about that. Um, and if he's in recovery, you know, is he going to meetings? Does he have a sponsor? Is this something that you can, you know, talk to, you know, and, and get it, get engaged in that process as well, you know? Um, and, and that's how I would go about dealing with that. Gaming and gambling are the things coming up more and more. Now, when families are calling, it's substance abuse and mental health issues. But I'm just telling you, gaming and gambling are becoming more and more prevalent in just my phone calls. So it doesn't oh. seem out of the norm to bring this up. But uh, all right. My husband and I told my 34-year-old son we would get him his own apartment if 
he went to treatment and did 30 days. Facility says this that his own apartment is a terrible idea. But we promised, Kevin. So here's one of those moments, mom and dad, where it's okay to break your promise because you made the promise based upon probably a bad idea. And and so what I would say is you're going to, It's I, I get this all the time, by the way. It's like, well, we told them we'd buy them a car or a house or, you know, or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. But I think one of the things we have to grasp and understand is that you were bribing him. And that's old family behavior. And we're going to get rid of the old family behavior. So we're no longer bribing people to do the right thing. What we're going to do instead is hold them accountable and hold boundaries. So it's okay to go back and say, you know what? We realized we were wrong and we're not going to do that. Um, what we will do is continue to support you as long as you're willing to engage in treatment, whether that's inpatient, PHP, IOP, sober living, we will continue to pay. We will continue to participate. We will continue to support your choices as long as you continue to participate in the program. Um, and that's going to be our commitment to this as you know, um, but we are not going to give you rewards and prizes um, for staying sober. Your reward and prize for staying sober is staying sober. Um, but, and, and I, that's, I know that the family feels like, oh, but we're going back on our word. Isn't that showing him a bad example? No, it's not because you're going back on your word that you never should have given in the first place. And what you're doing is saying, we made a mistake and we're going to correct that mistake. Because the truth is, if he gets out of treatment and you set him free into his own apartment and probably his own money, it, it's, he's going to go right back out. So. That would be one of those moments. There was a great ad that the uh, uh, the drug drug free America or some government council put together put a couple of years ago or ten years ago. It said it's okay to be a hypocrite, <laughs> you know, for parents. So it's like, how do I tell my kid that he shouldn't smoke pot when I smoke pot? They're like, it's okay. <laughs> We're giving you permission to be a hypocrite, and it is okay, you know, and and because you know. Uh, Sure. I, you know, I know people that say that I smoked pot when I was a kid. I'm like, yeah, but somehow you managed to quit and get a, go to college and get a job and be successful. Your kids in the basement smoking pot all day and he's not leaving. So that's, it's different, you know, so same thing. Treatment is only part, I mean, just the start of the journey. I think families yeah. need to understand this too. And I mean, I, you know, it may have been an intervention situation where they, Basically, just the ultimate goal is get him to go to treatment. It's all right, like Kevin said, to go back on your word. But sending him back into his own apartment after 30 days of treatment, I can just tell you that my experience shows like the family always calls back and said something went wrong. I don't understand. He started isolating and went back to old behavior. So yep. <clears throat> please, please do not go back to the uh, the uh, – your own apartment. It's just a terrible idea. Aftercare, 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 just the start of the journey. The 30 days is almost like a detox. His brain, his body, his life is everything. Just part of the journey. That's all I'm saying. Yep. The real work starts the day after they leave. Yeah. Medication assisted treatment, harm reduction, methadone are things suggested to me for my 18 year old son, is this different than what you two suggest? How do these fit into setting boundaries? Well, all kinds of buzz words going around on Google. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, they are definitely, uh, so things suggested for your 18 year old son. So, so let's talk about what those three things are. Um, MAT, method and medication assisted treatment, is uh, certainly something that's become uh, popular recently uh, for a lot of different reasons, some good, some not so good. Um, the initial one is that for people that are struggling with opiates, um, medication assisted treatment is probably a great idea because someone that's taking a set, especially a large amount of opiates or benzos um, they're going to need a taper down. You can't just take someone and rip the opiates out of them. Their body's going to react really severely. The same thing with alcohol and marijuana. I mean, it's just, it's brutal. The body becomes dependent upon the chemical and makeup. Um, so it's while they're in treatment, uh, they'll need that. Um, harm reduction 
is saying, well, okay, so instead of drinking 24 beers a day, how about we try drinking 12 beers a day, you know, or let's try drinking six beers a day. Um, and again, there are some people that can do that. Um, or, you know, let's, let, it's what, the, what we're talking about is trying what we call controlled drinking or controlled drug use. Um, and then the last one, the methadone. Methadone is a, uh, sort of a, an artificial or synthetic opiate. Um, I'm not a huge fan of methadone. Now it's, it's a medication, it's like MAT. Um, it's sort of an old school methodology. The thing about MAT and methadone is the danger of it is that you become dependent upon it forever. Um, the idea that I like is when you use it as a titration, sort of use for working your way down. Um, and I get where that, I get the significance of it. I understand and I'm not against it. I'm against it as a forever solution. I understand that some people definitely need it and I'm not opposed to that. Here's the thing I would say is that for your 18 year old son, I think he probably needs treatment. In that treatment program, they're probably gonna take a look at abstinence-based programs that may be assisted by medication uh, assisted treatment. And I think I would definitely listen to what the psychiatrists and the therapists and the program directors have to say there. I do not know your son's case. I do not know your situation. I'm certainly not going to pass judgment or give you recommendations. Um, so that would be dangerous and foolish of me to do so. Um, but those, I mean, I don't know who you're getting these, these who's whispering in your ear, but I would definitely say if, if, if you're being told medication assisted treatment and you're being told methadone, it strikes me that your son is probably using heroin or opiates. And so inpatient treatment is probably necessity ASAP. And I would get him into help ASAP because I would hate to see him die, which is probably where, you know, that's probably the line that you're getting close to. I hope that makes sense. Well done, sir. Well done. Well done. I think you can throw out harm reduction, by the way. <laughs> Our son is in a state-run drug treatment facility. He has a few felonies on his record, all drug-related. Are yeah. there resources you suggest using to help with job, housing, et cetera? You know, um, I don't know what state you're in. I don't know. I'm, I, can't, I can't throw resources around for what the situation is um, because I don't know where you are. However, I know that if he, the, the, where he's at will probably have a list of resources that do help some folks with felonies. And it, a lot of that's going to depend upon whether or not it's a, um, um, uh, what do we call it, um, a violent felony, but there's another term for it. I can't remember what it's called, um, a nonviolent felony, you know, and uh, and and so that's really, uh, you know, and that's good. That's what you're going to want to look for. I think your, your, your legal, uh, you know, your lawyer, uh, or what a legal aid is going to be able to help you with that situation as well. I'm not a good resource for that. Uh, I would say that your probation officer, your legal aid, and whatever treatment program he's in is probably going to have a better better grasp of those resources than I would. Um, it's going to be a, a much harder hill to climb because of that situation, but it is climbable. I have plenty of friends in recovery that have climbed that hill. It's harder. Um, restaurants are always kind of one of the places folks like that construction tends to be another place where folks like that end up. Um, and it's definitely a tough hill to climb, um, you know, but that's where they, but they are capable and they do end up there. Um, you know, and I would say that, you know, depending on what state you're in and where you're at, you can always send me an email and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, chase it down for you and find out where, who, who it is, who to talk to. I definitely know people that are in that world. And I'm happy to, you know, ask. It's my pleasure to ask. I'm always happy to help. You know, once he gets into the fellowship, too, and he gets out of treatment, they should, uh, you know, what I love about the fellowship is all different backgrounds, all different uh, ways to get in that present moment. There's, there's always people willing to help, and there's always people that may or may not own a company or something like that or have a felony themselves. So... Yeah. connection communication two things necessary can't really do it for him like kevin always says but i mean yeah there's resources there's you know with his state run i mean i'm sure it's a common 
uh, you know, the issue, I'm sure there's resources available if you communicate and, and connect and so forth. Just, just, I know several, I mean, I, I know a lot of success, very successful people that have overcome felonies and so forth. But, you know, the key is they stayed sober, they got into recovery and, and changed their lives around. But, uh, yeah. good question. All right. During dinner with my daughter and her sponsor, I learned that my my daughter told her sponsor that she contemplated suicide during her addiction. Aren't sponsors required by law to report suicidal thoughts, Kevin? Uh, no, they are not. Sponsors are not mandatory reporters. Um, I am <laughs> because of those four initials at the end of my name, licensed marriage and family therapist, which, by the way, when I sponsor someone, I tell them, I said, I really want to be super clear with you. I'm happy to be your sponsor. I need to let you know something. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, and that carries a responsibility that there are some things that if you share with me, I have to respond to. And, I, and if you're going to commit a crime, I have to turn you in. <laughs> if you're going to contemplate hurting yourself, I have to do something about it. If you're going to contemplate hurting somebody else, I have to do something about that. It's not because I'm a narc. It's because I don't want to lose my career. You know? <laughs> and, and, and I've actually had situations where that got challenged. And I said, whoa, 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 stop, stop talking. Stop talking. <laughs> and, and I was like, you know, what, what, what? I said, you understand I'm a licensed therapist. And, and I was like, I, I'm, I'm not telling you not to talk. I'm just telling you, be careful where you're going. And it turned out not to be a thing, but I was just like, time out, time out, time out. <laughs> and uh, but that's, no, sponsors are not. And, and on the flip side of that, this is a very important thing to understand as well. Sponsors do not have confidentiality. Um, as a therapist, I have a limited level of confidentiality um, that, that actually can get broken through um, lawsuits. Um, uh, priests, ordained priests do, sponsors do not. And that has been taken to court and, and AA loss. And so let's be super duper clear. Uh, your sponsor does not have confidentiality. There is no sponsor sponsee covenant, you know, um, so that is some, that is super critical to understand as well. Yeah, I mean it's it's ongoing. I mean, my mom and, and dad kind of I mean, there's anyone in the heart of addiction has always had that thought of just what if I wasn't here and so forth. And so I know that's you know, what Kevin did was perfectly fine. I mean, there the thoughts are there, and so if she's in recovery, if she's actively working with a sponsor. I'd be willing to bet that, uh, I think it's a great, I mean, bring up the question. So, so many people have questions over sponsorship, so keep it going. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's welcome to addiction, so, and sponsorship. Oh, yeah. All right, last question. I'm curious as to what it is, it was that kept you two sober. What changed? I, I okay, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Um, they're wanting to know our experience. So basically this is a, this is the question of like, they've been through numerous treatments as, you know, people continue to relapse. Why, why, what made, what, what happened in our lives? You know, for me, you know, it's getting connected with self and they want to know how did we, how did we, what, what did we, what led us to believe, to get us on the path to recovery, I guess. Oh. If I'm reading this, oh. if I'm reading this story, like, Despite all the relapses, and because I went through eight treatments, I don't know if you knew that or not. I mean, but I did. so if they no, if they if the family's heard, but you know, I get it all the time when I when people hear you went through eight treatments and they say like, well, what changed? And I mean, it's one of those questions. I wish I knew the magic answer, but I mean, what I always say is authentic authenticity number one, first and foremost, vulnerability and, and connection. But when I get when I got connected, vulnerable enough to get connected to myself and to others, something changed. So that's my easy way out. What do you got, Kevin? Well, let me tell you, Jay. <laughs> um, what, I'll tell you what happened. And it's, it's, I was really funny because I was actually interviewed this morning on a podcast about mental health and they asked me this question. And um, 
what happened was is that my dad uh, in 1990 uh, sat me down and said, you're my only son and I love you, but I don't believe a word out of your mouth and I'm, and we're done. And we took a vote and you're out, you know, and, and I'd heard this before. I mean, I think that's the important thing to understand is that, you know, it wasn't like my mom and dad were like, we love you and you need to quit drinking. And I was like, okay. You know, I was like, Oh God, this again, you know, and <laughs> Jesus, when are you, when are you guys going to knock this crap off? You know, I had come to the belief in my life that this is just the ticket to the, you know, if you want to live the rock star lifestyle, you got to pay the rock star price, you know, and, and that means you're just going to have to live like this. And, um, what was, what was, what was really, uh, made clear to me is that I was going to have to start living without my family. And, and what they did this time around is they locked it down and they didn't communicate with me for six weeks. And I lived in the same town, you know, and I, you know, they were just like, bang out sayonara. And, and, uh, and that freaked me out. I mean, it really freaked me out. And so I was like, okay, what do I got to do? And they were like, you got to go get help. And, uh, and then I started, started seeing a therapist and that therapist, I saw him with my dad and that therapist really cracked us both open. And then my parents went out of town. That, that was, I didn't get sober, you know, and that therapist, my parents went out of town and then that therapist was like, look, man, you're an alcoholic and you need help. And I was like, yeah. And, and again, that was nine months later and I continued to drink. I mean, at that point, you know, <laughs> you know, the last three or four months of my drinking were not great. You know, I mean, just bombs were going off. I was stepping on landmines every day. You know, shit was going south. And I was just like, good Lord, what next? You know, and and nobody. And here's the thing. Nobody was rescuing me. You know, there was no help. I was you know, losing jobs, losing girlfriends, losing friends. They were coming to repossess my car. I was getting kicked out of my apartment. And my family was just standing there like, wow, that sucks. <laughs> Where are you going to sleep? And I'm like, oh, well, can't you hook me up? And they're like, nope. <laughs> and, you know, and there's just, and I was just like, you know, just getting closer and closer and closer. And, and, and then this guy was like, you need to go to AA. And I was like, fuck it. All right, fine. This is what it's come to. I'm going to those people, you know? And uh, that was the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. So I got miserable. I, I mean, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I got miserable because the people around me stopped rescuing me. Was the no communication for six weeks, was that new? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they locked it down. And then after that, the part that was really important after that was they communicated with me, but there was no rescues. Yeah. There was there was no, you know, there, there was all very much like, okay, cool, mm -hmm. good luck. You know, hope that works out. Love you, but no. You know, no money, no handouts, no, I was on my own, you know, and, uh, and I mean, I just kept hitting the wall. I mean, every time I turned around, shit was just, just when I'm like, what the hell, you know, and, and they just wouldn't, they, I mean, I'm sure, and I, they told me that it was like, man, it was hard for them to stand back and watch me just, you know, get the door slammed on my fingers constantly. And they were just like, oh, yeah. well, you know. And, uh, and so that's what happened and what keeps me sober. And I, I mean, I'll just be really clear. And this is just, I am an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I work the 12 steps. I have a sponsor. I sponsor people. That's how I live. And, you know, when I, when I got into, when I showed up in May 5th in 1991, when I got sober and when I started going to AA, it was drilled into me that, you know, this is how we live. And then the guys that drilled it into me had, had 20, 30, 40 years sober. And they were like, let me be clear. This is it. This is the, this is it. There's no secret bonus option. This is it. And I was like, okay, I got it. This is it. And, and they had lives. They had families, they had wives, they had jobs, they had cars. And I don't, I don't mean like big money. I mean, they had, they had a, they went to a job every day. They had a house. 
Nobody was, no one was threatening to take stuff from them, you know, and, and they could pay for dinner, you know, <laughs> I couldn't do those things. Yeah. You know, yeah. I was like, shit, man, I want, I want that. And they were like, well then go to the goddamn meeting and do what we tell you to. I was like, okay, okay. And there were no shortcuts, no shortcuts. Yeah. I mean, it's like you, I believe in that same fellowship and the same program. And I mean, and it's, uh, I was, people think I'm joking or something, I, you know, cause I love humor. I love laughing and, and so forth, but I still remember going to my Saturday morning men's meeting with my sponsor that I picked to get out of, basically get out of treatment. But he <laughs> took me to the Saturday morning men's meeting and he had guys laughing, like genuinely authentically laughing and when I realized, and I didn't want to admit it to anyone, it's been a while since I I didn't have to force a laugh, like to portray like I was whatever. These guys were genuinely like laughing. And people say, what what was it? And I said, I connected to that. And I just said, like, hey, from here on out, if that laughter was genuine, so tell me what to do. And it's the same. I just, I, you know, I went Saturday morning. I went to that same meeting. I mean, that was 14 years later and some change. So, uh, and told that exact same story when someone said, Hey, what, you know, do you like this meeting? And I was like, well, let me tell you about this meeting. We laugh. And he's like, what do you mean? We genuinely laugh. So that's, I can't tell you what it is, but for whatever reason, the law of AA and the suggestions, uh, I just believe I implemented in my life, no matter what, and yeah. it's change. Yeah, yeah, so. you know, and they, you know, those dudes are sober and they have good lives still. And the guys that I, a lot of the guys that I hang out with, same thing, man. And they're not, it's not sexy and it's not exciting and it's not like, ooh, but it's just like, you know, okay, cool. You know, and we have fun and we have good people and they're, you know, it's, um, you know, it's just, it's fun, you know, it's fun. And, and that's really what it comes down to. And I don't, uh, I don't know. That's, that's I me. Mean, honestly, when I showed up, man, I just was like, God damn, I just want, I want the goddamn roller coaster to stop, you know? And, and that's, and really that was all I was looking for is no more roller coaster. So, you know, well, you did good. No more roller coaster tonight. We'll 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 let you off. Time to go home. Time to go have some Mexican food or whatever you eat in Denver, and uh, <laughs> we will do this again next week. Yes, sir, we will, and I'll be uh, back home in Jacksonville Beach. Keep the questions coming. If you're watching a replay of this, put it in the comments. We'll get to your questions. Keep DMing. Somehow, you guys are finding me and getting the questions. Keep keep it coming. We All we right. love them. We to. love them. And it makes question. it makes Kevin sometimes a little uncomfortable. So let's challenge the questions. Let's get Kevin uncomfortable. Yeah. All right. Next All right. week. Okay, buddy. <laughs>